This is Lynn Brown. I'm executive director of the Bradamus Center, which is delighted to be able to bring you this conversation this evening. I have a very brief, I promise, introduction just to set the stage, and then I'll get out of the way and we can listen to our panelists. This is the second in a series of what we hope will be enlightening and even provocative conversations on the topic of civility. Now, civility can be a slippery concept, meaning different things at different times to different people. Our aim in these explorations is not to pin the concept down, but rather to enrich it, to let it roam over different perspectives and fields and gather in the knowledge from varying perspectives, such as art, history, politics, religion, psychology, uh, all of those into the mix of this conversation. The Bradamus Center has taken on this project both because of its mission and the legacy of our founder, John Bradamus, who was a member of the United States Congress for over 20 years and then president of NYU for over a decade. John was a fierce partisan during his days in Washington, DC, but he was always deeply devoted to the legislative process and the belief that reasoned discourse could be had across a wide political spectrum. Here at Washington Square, he also thought one of the roles of a university like NYU was to provide a space for reflection and debate. We began the series last month with what we called interrogating civility, asking a set of questions such as, is civility always a good thing? Whom does it benefit? disadvantage, and what are its limits? Are there new ways of thinking about civility? Tonight, we turn to the role of civility in the political realm. How important is it to guiding political discourse and behavior? How important in the well-ordered running of our political institutions and in the very protection of democratic norms? We have a luminous panel to engage the topic, and in the role of moderator, a sure-footed guide, whom I will introduce next. Just one final thought before I introduce our moderator. Against the backdrop of recent events in Ukraine, the notion of civility may seem, what? Not meeting the moment. But I think not, and I hope not, for what we want to explore this evening are exactly those next I. How can we use civility to strengthen norms of decency and behavior and the rule of law and a democratic liberal order? Civility and civilization share the same etymological roots. So much is at stake. And now to our moderator, Karen Jackson Weaver is the Senior Associate Vice President of Global Faculty Engagement and Innovation Advancement at NYU. That title alone tells you the many hats she wears and the many important projects she takes on for the university. Her expertise is in educational policy, history specializing in religion, ethics, and political affairs. Before coming to NYU, she served in many places you will recognize in the Pantheon, Oxford University, Princeton University, Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And she has helped study and pass on important and searing insights into not only a uh, spectrum of how, for instance, to teach religious studies, but also how to reframe the African-American presence in American history. A scholar, a teacher, an empathic guide, I now turn us over to Karen Jackson Weaver. Karen? Thank you so much, Lynn, for that gracious introduction. And thank you so much for your leadership and the work that you're doing with the Bradamus Center. We are excited about the Civility Project and we're excited about tonight's session. As Lynn introduced and situated for us, tonight's discussion centers on the role of civility, politics, political institutions, and democracy. And tonight we're going to be addressing the question of how essential is civility in conducting politics, guiding political behavior, and protecting democracy. In particular, our panelists will examine the interplay of trust and transparency and 
political processes, as well as the effects of institutional rules and systems that have led to the decline of compromise and the rise of politics as performance in Congress. We'll also talk about the power of presidential rhetoric and framing, not just in terms of the national agenda, but also in terms of what it means to be civil or uncivil and what this means in a global context. Before I introduce our wonderful panels, I just wanna say a little bit about the etymology that Lynn referred to. We know that civility comes from the word civis. It's Latin for citizen. And when we think about civility, it's normally thought of as civilized conduct, courtesy, or politeness, a polite act or expression. And when we think about the etymology of the word uh, civis, meaning citizen, it relates to citizens. And in its early use, the term denoted the state of being a citizen and hence good citizenship or orderly behavior. So in our conversation tonight, we're going to examine the role of civility in politics. We're gonna examine it as it plays out in political institutions as well as democracy. And finally, we'll talk about incivility, which is the polar opposite of civility. We'll need to try to understand the rise that we see in cyberbullying, rudeness, intolerance, discrimination, vandalism, even verbal and physical attacks. Tonight, we are joined by an esteemed group of panelists. I hope that you've had a chance to visit their bios on the center's website. I'd like to take a moment now to briefly introduce them so that you have a greater familiarity for their expertise and background. First, we have Professor Julia Azari. She is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Marquette University. Her research and teaching interests include the American presidency, American political parties, the politics of the American state and qualitative research methods. Her research has been supported by the Harry Middleton Fellowship in Presidential Studies and the Harry Truman Library Institute Scholars Award. Next, we have Professor Mikey Edwards. He is a lecturer in public and international affairs at Princeton University. He represented Oklahoma's fifth district in Congress from 1977 through 1993. He served in the House Republican leadership and was a member of the Appropriations and Budget Committees. Budget committees. He taught for over a decade at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he was the John Quincy Adams lecturer in legislative practice. Our next panelist is Norman J. Ornstein, a senior fellow emeritus at American Enterprise Institute, where he studied politics, elections, and the US Congress for over four decades. Along with Thomas Mann and Michael Malbin, he created Vital Statistics on Congress in 1980, a go-to reference guide updated every two years that provided data for congressional watchers. He previously served as co-director of the AEI Brookings Election Reform Project and is an advisor to the Continuity of Government Commission. I wanna thank all of our panelists for making time to be with us this evening. And first we're going to start with Julia and then we'll have Mikey followed by Norman. So at this time, I'd like to turn over the conversation to Julia. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thank you so much to the hosts for, for inviting me to this important conversation. So I wanna talk a little bit about the duality of the decline in civility in politics. The decline in civility in politics, I, I, I feel has been linked like virtually everything else to the two big topics of our time, partisan polarization and the former president, Donald Trump. And in connection with these two topics, this has really been uh, the kind of decline of civility and the lament of that decline has been part of that conversation. But there's also an alternate parallel and clashing conversation. And, and that take on civility is that it's used to silence marginalized voices and to tone police people who are demanding very, very basic justice and decent treatment. What I wanna do in my short time here is to think about the, the functions of civility as they relate to the evolution of modern presidential and party politics. And I think that if we break the concept down in this way, we actually can start to reconcile these two views of civility and understand how they continue to coexist in tension. I'm also gonna define civility for our purposes really broadly. Um, and I'm, my working definition is that it, it is norms about the kinds of language and claims that are acceptable in the, in the course of standard political discourse. And I, 
I conceptualize, I realized this as I was at the end of writing these comments, that I conceptualize civility as a boundary. And like all boundaries, it can be both useful and very corrosive. So I, I'm gonna identify three main functions of civility in, in modern politics. And these are very much derived from my research interests in presidential rhetoric and party politics. The first is to acknowledge the legitimacy of the opposition. To acknowledge that your opponent has a, a rightful place in the political debate and incivility undermines that sense of legitimate opposition. The second is to protect individuals in the political space. And the third is, is to preserve power. Each of these functions I think can, can sort of serve or undermine important small d democratic ends. Um, they can serve marginalized voices or they can undermine them. Um, so I want to start with the role of civility and acknowledging the opposition is right to exist and contest. This is, I think, important to start with for a couple of reasons. One is that it's probably the most obvious and kind of con cognitively accessible function that civility performs in our in our political system. And it's often, I think, what's at the bottom of the polarization connection. When Republicans and Democrats call each other names, when they impugn each other's motives, when they question each other's right to participate in a given space or conversation or exercise, it undermines the possibility that we can be fighting for a shared good despite our different views. I also have kind of a, a temporal question, I think when, when we think about this function of, of civil discourse, does a decline in civility come before these kinds of major disagreements or does it, does it just reflect an underlying problem? I think searching for deeper answers to these types of questions can help us identify really what's going on in partisan, in partisan polarization and its relationship to incivility. Does uncivil language give the appearance of fundamental disagreement when none exists? Does it deeper, deepen that? Does civil discourse actually mask deeper existential disagreements? This question speaks to some large and, and empirical, not normative debates in political psychology about the nature of polarization. One question is essentially how much of our current polarization is really deeply about issue disagreement and principle disagreement? And how much is just Democrats and Republicans having developed dislike for each other? This is a real debate among political behaviorists and political psychologists. And there is research that does suggest that, that uncivil language shapes people's affect, it shapes people's response to political discourse. And there's also um, a really wonderful book about um, called Disrespectful Democracy by Emily Sidnor that talks about how uncivil discourse alienates people who are conflict averse. And so it has this, this corrosive impact on participation. Um, I've also thought a lot about this topic in relation to the presidency. And I think it really helps us understand the relationship between the position of the speaker in the impact of uncivil or borderline uncivil questionable discourse. I, I've actually written quite a bit about this in the uh, kind of retrospectives of the Obama presidency. Obama's sometimes very casual language would, you know, he would say things about, you know, the police in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2009 acted stupidly. He called Kanye West a jackass. Like, these are not necessarily particularly egregious incidents, but they sort of mix poorly with the presidency. You can't call people stupid when you have the nuclear codes. Um, and I think that that space kind of opened up what then became a much sort of deeper set of questions with his successor. And I think that the, the language um, and the, the pressing of the boundaries of stability in this presidential rhetoric space, that there's more linkage there between Obama and Trump than people care to admit. That's usually a sentence that by the end of it, I've alienated every everyone in the room. Um, so go civility panel. Um, but, you know, Trump took this to a new level and would, would tweet insults or say insults about legislators, about journalists, and, you know, most chillingly, occasionally private citizens um, during the campaign and during his presidency. And I think it sort of opens up the space of like things I could say because nobody cares what I say. Um, and things that when the president says it, it, it brings in a new power dynamic. And I think that really helps us get a, get a grasp on um, the work that civility is doing around this question of who, who can legitimately be in the polity. Like the president gets to, the president has power in defining that in a way that most other people do not. 
The second point I want to raise um, is one that I actually have not really seen anywhere, but I think is distinctly important for understanding US politics. And this is a more historical one. I think it's really notable that in the early Republic of the 19th century, when you go back and look at those debates, they're not very civil. They're pretty markedly uncivil. And the other thing that they're not is they're, they're not compared with 20th century politics, very individualistic. It's a very much a kind of partisan collective enterprise. The party machines are really powerful. In the 20th century, politics becomes much more about individual politicians. And civility becomes really critical to allow for individual politicians to participate without their children or their religion or you know, things that are really personal to them. The, those things are sort of considered out of bounds. Um, and this also relates to developments in the media. So as politics comes to center the individual in the 20th century, we also get the expansion of the types of media that can reveal your life. And that makes it more important to have boundaries around what kinds of aspects of, of someone's life are up for discussion. And so where we find ourselves in our current moment is that politics, I think in some ways have become less personal as, partisan, as hyper-partisanship has um, resurged. And so it's less about, you know, what is this individual's character like? And now it's just Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals all the time. Um, but it is hyper-mediated. So people in the public eye don't get a lot of privacy. And that means that if, it, if at any moment you can be on a video, you can be shared in a viral way on social media, you can be part of a 24 hour news cycle, that we, we still have this kind of persistent need for norms around what is fair game. And that I think really informs some of the focus on civility, but also makes some of the discussion about civility seem kind of stale because our politics are, are, have moved away from this like 20th century focus on, um, on the individual. <coughs> Julia, I'm gonna stop you there. Okay. So that we can go, but I'm gonna, you've given us a lot of food for thought and you raised a lot of critical ideas. We're gonna come back to you in a moment, but I wanna make sure that we get to Mickey. Mickey, please jump in. I know you have a lot to say on this. And then as soon as we hear from Mickey, we're gonna hear from Norman. Thank you. Uh unmuted. Perfect. Yeah, this is sort of, well, I never had to do that on my typewriter. You know, I just didn't have to unmute. Um, but Julia, that, that, was, that was an excellent uh, comment. Uh, it's very, you know, it's been a long time since I've actually written out anything uh, that I was going to say, but I know we're going to be uh, putting this in printed form later on. So I did that. So, you know, I hope that works uh, out okay. Um, so America is at a at an inflection point. Major elements of our liberal democracy are under attack. Respect for the outcome of elections, truthfulness, trust in the press and the courts. And with our democracy teetering, so too is our constitutional republic. The structural and institutional framework designed to ensure justice, honor, equality, serve the common good, empower the majority without trampling the equal rights of the non-majorities, our laws, our rules, and our norms are under challenge. America, a nation that was woven from the diversity of its time, had a natural motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one. But unum, the, open, the oneness of America is increasingly difficult to find. So given such a framework to work with, and I'm going back to what Lynn Brown said, uh, given such a dire framework to work with, how does something so minor sounding as civility niceness and good manners matter. So I want to look at some important numbers. 50, 3,090, 330, 48 million. 50 states, 3,090 counties, parishes, and boroughs, 330 million people, 48 million immigrants from almost every country in the world. That's the United States. This is not Sweden. And the immigrant number is misleading because when you add in the children and grandchildren of immigrants, uh, that means that the friends and neighbors and work colleagues and fellow students and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who live in the same city as you, the same state, you know, who all came from different backgrounds. My grandparents spoke Yiddish and they brought with them the culture and norms of the shtetls of Europe. Others brought the customs and beliefs and religions of Peru. 
or Laos or Kenya. There is assimilation, but assimilation can only add another layer onto the deeper veins of history and tradition. So how in the world can we make a nation like this work? Isn't civility too small a thing to be of any help? Well, civility is not just niceness or good manners or tolerance. It's something deeper. It's respect. Respect for the humanity even of even those we disagree with most ardently and are most determined to defeat. It's a shared openness, listening without simultaneously forming a rebuttal in your mind, not just listening, but hearing, and it's restraint. Not every thought triggered in your mind needs to come shooting out of your mouth. But how does that change anything? Civility may be a nice thing in other societies, but that's simply even in totalitarian states, just being respectful and kind. That's a mark of recognizing humanness. But in America, an America, the large, the diverse, the divided, civility, respect, and restraint are democracy's lifeblood. There are too many of us, and we have too many differences. If we allow ourselves to be defined by where we diverge, our democracy will die. Civility must come from within, right? Or imbued from childhood, taught at the mother's knee. In fact, civility can be and must be enforced by rule. Even adult humans can continue to learn. You know, I slouch in my office sometimes. I perch on the edge of my desk. Uh, and when I was first elected to Congress, I brought with me those habits. And I learned quickly that conforming to different behaviors was not a matter of choice. Among my new colleagues were friends, people I played golf with, whose homes I visited, whose families I knew. Nothing would have been more natural for me to just have engaged with them casually, but those rules would not let me do that. I could not interrupt if, if Norm was a member at the same time. I could not just say, hey, Norm, how about this? I had to stand and speak and call him the gentleman from Washington. Um, and if they would not yield, I could not ask them at all because we had to respectfully dress, address other people, stand at attention, show in everything we did by rules and norms how much we were committed to treating each other as fellow uh, members of Congress and humans. We, we had other norms. Members of Congress did not help colleagues campaign against each other. Members of Congress knew that party solidarity was fine if you're into all that sort of thing, but I'm not. The guiding principle was the need to maintain enough mutual respect to be able to work with, negotiate with, compromise with colleagues whose right to be there and represent their constituencies and their consciences were the equal of my own. Those norms the address the first reality, our differences. No matter how great those differences, how strongly we feel about our own views, in a Congress of 535 members, a presidency with veto powers, courts prepared to step in if we cross the constitutional line, nothing happens. No spending on health care or national defense or public education, no authorization of agency initiatives, no appointing of judges or military commanders, unless we can sit down together, talk to each other, trust each other. Civility is the scotch tape, the glue, the solder, the connecting tissue that allows a large, diverse democracy to work. Tocqueville, in writing about this relatively new United States, found what he thought was the key to our success. The webs of institutions and associations that brought us all together. Frederick Turner wrote about the American frontier and how it gave rise to a new sense of confidence. And when I teach Turner and Tocqueville at Princeton, I notice that while the Western mindset strengthened the sense of independence and individuality, the real frontier erased old world hierarchies and gave rise to a new environment in which mutuality was an essential. Rousseau didn't create the social contract. It came to life from a world of interdependence. People had to stick together or fail separately. And that meant a world in which one's word had to be given with serious intent, trust had to be earned and expected. None of that happens without strangers coming together, 
Congress doesn't happen unless strangers come together and talk together. It doesn't happen without the basic civility, the key to building a community, and the key to ensuring that a nation and a democracy can survive. That's it. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mickey. We really appreciate that, both you and- It's you. really hard doing it from written. I haven't done that no. in years. I know, I know, but that, that was really wonderful. You gave us a lot to think about. And I want to come back to you and Julia in a moment, but I want us to move now to, to Norm. I know you have a lot to say about this topic, Norm. So we want to turn it over to you, and then we're going to get into some questions from the audience. So start thinking of those questions, audience. As soon as Norm finishes, we're going to hear from our some thoughts from our panelists. But Norm, we want to now turn to you. Uh, thanks so much, Karen. And let me say I'm delighted to be with my uh, dear friend Mickey and with Julia and uh, John Bradamus was a long dear friend of mine uh, and I know that if he were around today he would be appalled at what he sees in his longtime institution in uh, Congress. Uh, a couple of initial points reflecting on things that uh, uh, both uh, Mickey and, and Julia said. Uh, first, you know, Julia is right that the long history of the country is that uh, we've had long periods where uh, civility was not a, uh, a common theme. If you read uh, the great uh, Yale historian Joanne uh, Freeman's book, uh, Field of Blood, uh, or if you followed the history of Congress and of uh, Washington for a long time, we know that there were duels uh, at the time of the Civil War. Um, it wasn't exactly civil when a member of the House uh, went over to the Senate and beat a senator senseless with his cane, uh, putting him out of commission for years. Um, at the same time, if we bring it up even closer to the present day, and here I take a little bit of issue with uh, Julia, um, FDR, for example, uh, as president, referred to his uh, enemies in pretty harsh terms and said, I welcome their hatred. Uh, I do not view uh, what uh, uh, Barack Obama did as anywhere near uh, what we've seen with other presidents. That didn't trigger what we have in the current moment. In fact, I think what began to trigger what we have in the current moment, which is not about political polarization, it's about tribalism. You can be polarized, view people on the other side of the aisle as being deeply misguided in their views, but they're honorable people. We're all Americans. We're all a part of the institution and view it in a different way. When I first came to Washington, the Speaker of the House was John McCormick. And John McCormick was famous for never using uh, epithets. And I used to teach about Congress and say that when McCormick got particularly upset with an opponent of his, he went on the floor and said, I hold the distinguished gentleman in minimum high regard. That's what passed for uh, uh, his epithets then. And Mickey's right about all the time that he spent in Congress where the norms were strong. But he also knows that what began to change it and what moved us from the advent and expansion of uh, polarization where the parties became more homogeneous and divided ideologically was Newt Gingrich who consciously moved to blow up norms and to create a tribal era using language, uh, terms that he used himself and spread in classes to candidates and to his other members to use that moved us in a very different direction, all to accomplish his goal of getting the American people so disgusted with Congress that they would say enough of this, throw the ins out and bring the outs in. And he accomplished that goal of course, in 1994. It started us down this path, but at the same time that Newt was moving us in that direction and with lots of uh, assistance, he was getting help from the expansion of tribal media and what we now see as the advent of social media. That, it's, that themselves began to chip away at the fundamental norms of discourse and civility in the society as a whole, and reinforce it in uh, Congress and elsewhere. All of us who are uh, using social media know that people sometimes behind the cloak of anonymity will say outrageous and awful, racist, anti-Semitic and other things. 
And now they don't even care about uh, uh, anonymity so much anymore. And I would say that what Newt started became a massive accelerant with the candidacy of Donald Trump and the presidency of Donald Trump. When you call a, uh, a judge, a Mexican judge, when you refer to your opponents during the campaign as little Marco and lying Ted, when you accuse a candidate, uh, Ted Cruz, as Trump did, of having his father participate in the uh, uh, plot to assassinate uh, JFK, that moves us in a very different direction. When you look at the language used during rallies, not just during the campaign, but after Trump became president, the president is the big opinion leader. And Julia may be right that a couple of the things that Barack Obama said shook a little bit uh, the fabric here, but it's like uh, jaywalking as opposed uh, to uh, felony assault when we look at what's happened there. Now, tribalism, what's the difference? If you look at things through a lens of tribalism, you look at people on the other side of the aisle, not as worthy Americans, but as enemies who are trying to destroy your way of life. And when we look at surveys, including one done by my institution, AEI, and its monthly community survey, one of the best that's done, that 30% of Republicans, and not a, a trace element of Democrats, believe that violence is appropriate if people are trying to chip away at or destroy your way of life. If you believe that violence is appropriate, using bad language, poisoning the well in that fashion is a pretty small thing or a small step to take. And now with social media, including the way in which we have malign foreign actors and domestic ones spreading lies and using these social media with, I would say, the active uh, cognizance of Facebook and others to divide people and inflame those judgments, it puts us in an extremely difficult place. And when you have members of Congress who, for example, speak at white supremacist rallies, as Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene did, and their own party leader refuses to either condemn them or take action against them. It tells us that we're on a sadly downward slope towards a much more difficult political system than we have. It's difficult to get out of that. Once norms are destroyed, as my friend and mentor, the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, you define deviancy down and bad things that used to be absolutely shocking years ago become commonplace and normal now. Moving out of that is going to be extremely difficult. I'm hoping that as we see an expansion of debate in schools and elsewhere, where you have to take opposite sides and you have to learn other people's viewpoints, it might help a little bit at the grassroots level. But until there is some way of holding people accountable with shame, at least, for violating fundamental norms of behavior, we're not going to get out of the mess we're in. And we're not going to find it easy, not just to make policy that benefits the country as a whole, or to deal with issues that fundamentally affect our national security, but to keep from a shattering of uh, the fundamentals that cement and hold our society to together. We are not in a good place right now. There is a history of this. This is worse than what we've seen in our lifetimes, and it's not going to get better anytime soon. So have a nice day. Well, Norm, thank you for that sobering um, observation, but, but thank you for also pushing us to really challenge ourselves to reflect and understand what it means in this contemporary context. And I, and I wanna pull you in, Norm, along with Mickey and Julia to kind of highlight some of the things that we heard tonight. We, we already have some questions in the chat. So I wanna thank our audience for, for being ready and engaged with us. Uh, there were a number of points that, that all of you raised, and I just wanna to tie together some observations Observations, and I'm seeing some of this line of thinking in the chat as well. Julia, you raised the question about shared good. Are there ways that we can invoke the importance of civility by making sure there's a shared understanding of what a shared good actually is or means? You talked about presidential rhetoric and how have we seen that in, in various contexts. 
uh, the power dynamic as well that plays into civility. Mickey, you really gave us a lot to think about when you talked about the importance of civility as an inflection point and it being something that's critical for our democracy. And I love how you talked about and gave us some context for understanding uh, in many ways how this functions as a code of ethics. There's this understanding, there's a respect for one's humanity and there's both, there's the respect and the recognition of one's humanity. And so all of that was embedded in, in what you shared with us this evening. And Norm, I really wanna thank you for pushing us and helping us to understand the distinction between what it really means when we talk about polarization and tribalism, right? What, how do we unpack that and make sense of that? I, I also wanna thank you, Norm, for really helping us to understand uh, some of the contemporary contexts of this, right? Seeing kind of the shift that took place with New Gingrich, but also looking at the influence of technology and social media. Uh, how do we make sense of this? And we have some questions in the chat that I wanna uh, add to this so that I can ask you all to address them. Our first question is from Jim. And Jim raises the question, which kind of frames, which is framed in this way. Um, considering where we are, with various political figures displaying a fundamental lack of respect for others and seeing no benefit to being civil to, mother, to others, why should they be civil when they clearly lack the underlying respect that civility conveys? So if you all can give us some thoughts around that idea, um, we're gonna open that up and then get to some other questions. So Julia, Mickey, Norm, please jump. It's a bad situation. I, I agree with everything Norm said. Uh, and including, you know, where it started to fall apart. Uh, I, I, I would add something, I don't know if he would go this far, uh, but clearly polarization is, is not the problem. Every, every society, every, you know, in your own family, there's polarization. It may be not that far apart, maybe that far apart, uh, but it, and it's the tribalism and tribalism in American language is parties. It's the party system, the party primaries, you know, that that's our fundamental problem and we have to change that dynamic. But it matters even if the differences are great because no side of any of these debates is strong enough to get everything it wants. We have to, that's why I went through all these numbers, how big we are, how diverse we are. Unless we compromise, nothing happens. So uh, Ronald Reagan was, was always talking about this. I'll put it in other terms, you know, if you can move where you get 55% of what you're after, uh, then it's a victory, you know, and you, and you do it that way. So I'm trying to destroy the other people instead of finding a place where we can look for where, where we can come together, the UNUM, where is it we can agree? And, you know, that's the only way to market, our, make our democracy survive. Thank you so much for that, Mickey. Julia, Norm, you want to chime in? Sure. So I, I just want to kind of bring it back to the, the question of boundaries, because I think some of what we're seeing here is not just lack of respect, but actually like a deeper conversation about where the boundaries of the political system are and who belongs. And that's what's getting expressed in all of these kinds of really nasty and ugly conflicts. And I think that to some extent, the kinds of the kinds of compromises that Mickey is talking about are only possible when people have some basic kind of underlying agreement about who belongs in the polity and what the what the formal and informal rules are. And we're just at a point of flux about that. Um, and I think that accounts for some of some of what we're seeing. Let me, I, I wanna uh, tell one little story here um, that uh, my, I, another one of my mentors and dear friends was Alan Simpson, a longtime Senator uh, from uh, Wyoming and uh, Al, uh, would use plenty fiery language. He was a fierce partisan, but also somebody who worked across the aisle and appeared uh, appealed to all of the fundamental norms. So years after he left the Senate, he went back in uh, for a visit. And as he entered the chamber, or entered the uh, Capitol, he encountered uh, uh, Rick Santorum, uh, who had come from the House and moved to the Senate um, was one of the people highlighted in a very good book by political scientist Sean Theriot called The Gingrich Senators. And uh, they both went on to the floor together and Simpson spied Dale Bumpers, a Democratic Senator from Arkansas, 
went over, they embraced warmly, were having a nice chat, and he looked around and saw an agitated Santorum motioning him back. So he ambled back and said, uh, yeah, uh, what's up? And Santorum looked at him and said, pointed to bumpers and said, what's that all about? And uh, Simpson said, that's stale bumpers. We're like blood brothers. We came in together. We're dear friends. We work together on many things. And Santorum said to him, we don't do things like that around here anymore. Now I asked Simpson to make sure that wasn't apocryphal and it wasn't. And what we see from that is the erosion of these fundamental norms. You cannot go to the other side of the aisle, even in the Senate where they, the families mostly are in Washington, they interact together, they're together socially, they know each other. Things that we used to think would bind people together and keep them from uh, using the worst kind of language, which is easier to do if you don't know others. When you lose those norms and norms like that, then you really uh, are facing a deeply uphill battle. And what Sean Therio suggested is that as the norms were blown up in the House, people who moved to the Senate took a chamber that wasn't in that direction and poisoned it as well. And you could see it now uh, with the kind of language uh, and relationships that we find there uh, that really were not there 25 years ago. Thank you, thank you for that, Norm. And you're making me think of a recent story. Uh, this is uh, the late John Lewis, uh, who we lost last year. Um, this past Sunday was the 57th anniversary of the you know, Bloody Sunday. And I thought of it because Congressman Lewis would always bring a bipartisan group every year to Alabama. And regardless of the, uh, you know, the, the commitment to their, their party or their ideals or values, there was shared commitment to the work. And there was a sense of uh, commitment around uh, some of the things that they were doing there. And I thought about that this past Sunday for the 57th anniversary. And I wondered, you know, how is it that we've gotten away or the Congress has gotten away from that type of cooperation and that sense of mutual respect and civility? There's a question from Samuel along those same lines to the panel. And Samuel asks, how can we take the deep meaning of civility slash citizen to be framed in a context that allows us to see diverse and inclusive democratic republic ideals in which we can share the reality of peace within our own communities and among nations in which discourse, respect, and nurturing our environments and community have a reality for the improvement of all citizens, our own and those from other countries as well. How do we create this common destiny of peace, prosperity, and purpose? And I wanna just add one part to that. What Samuel is raising is really important because we know in October of 2019, the United Nations announced that the World Civility Index would be a part of their sustainable development goals. And so what Samuel is asking about is something that not only matters to us here in the United States, but this is something that the UN wants to see. This is a, really a global imperative. So can you all tell us a little bit, what are some ways that we should be thinking about uh, what Samuel has laid out with regards to peace and really thinking about this in a global context? So uh, I'll start. Um, this has to happen from the ground up with the public as a whole, but it also has to happen from the top down with the opinion leaders who dominate the discourse. And that includes not just politicians, but media people as well. Uh, from the bottom up, uh, I have been a part of a commission uh, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on citizenship. And we uh, spent a couple of years looking at a variety of ways in which uh, you could work in both directions. We have a report uh, called Our Common Purpose, which is easily available, and perhaps we can get a site up. I'll do it after I'm done speaking, uh, if not. Uh, but, you know, among the things uh, we can do, and there are groups out there in some cases doing it, Eric Liu with Citizen University in Seattle and others, trying to create forums where you can bring people with diverse views together and try and deal with it uh, in, in a civil fashion. I am a strong and a longtime proponent of national service. I think if you can bring people from diverse backgrounds together, working together, 
it can make a difference. There's no panacea out there. You know, people in the military are together uh, and they uh, are responsible for each other's lives. They come from wildly different backgrounds, but not everybody responds to that in the appropriate fashion, but it's a start. Um, we're a little far away from doing that sort of thing, but finding grassroots ways. I mentioned debate before. Um, I'm deeply involved with the urban debate process in Washington, DC. We have kids from Title I schools who have debate teams, they debate in tournaments, they do it civilly, they have to take every position. You have to know what your opponents are thinking before you can uh, get out there on the stage. And if we can expand that, including with debate-centered education, something that's been uh, pushed heavily uh, by Bob Lighton, a former government official, um, that can help. From the top down, one of the dilemmas we have the ethics process is supposed to police this to some degree. It's broken in both houses. The chairman of the House Ethics Committee, Ted Deutsch of Florida, is now going to retire from the House after a long and distinguished career. And I think, though I haven't talked to him, a part of it is his frustration with the ethics process. And here's one of the dilemmas, Karen. We've had a couple of members who violated ethical procedures over and over again, violated civility in the worst way, stripped of their committee assignments as a form of punishment. Now we have their party leaders saying, not only will he reinstate them if he's in the majority, but he'll strip a lot of people on the other side just punitively as a way of doing that. How do you censure people who violate fundamental norms if you know that instead of bringing things back on track, it's gonna result in a tit for tat and a kind of warfare that will further degrade the whole notion because you're not going to be uh, uh, basically punishing the miscreants. You're going to be punishing people just because they tried to punish the miscreants. So we've got a dilemma on our hands. And uh, fortunately, we have some members trying to do something about it and some good people out in the country. But it's a long, hard slog. It definitely is. Oh, um, let, let me jump in here. I, please, I, yes. I, I agree with everything that uh, Norm said. But you know how, how to get to the question, um, citizen is, is not a plural word, it's a singular word. A and uh, we have a lot of different citizens who help make up the tenor uh, of what our discourse is like. Uh, so social media, what people post on social media, what they choose to watch on and read on social media, what uh, uh, talk shows and uh, radio or television that are all lined up constantly to wage the, the partisan wars. Uh, so it, it's got to also start. I, I, I agree. The, the people at the top, the, the, the leaders uh, in Congress, whoever who is in the White House, all those things that make a difference. Uh, but we have to, if we're going to restore a civil democracy, which is what you have to have to make it work, uh, that's got to be begin with the people down home, one family at a time, one person at a time. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to post that uh, because we're not going to get there otherwise. It's really hard to imagine a civil national leadership presiding over an uncivil, uh, rowdy public. So it's it's uh, we're we're going to get there when when the people themselves take it seriously and say we're all in this boat together, you know this is our country together. It's a commons problem, uh, and we're going to have to deal with it with our own behavior. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Mickey and Julia. I want to pull you in as well and get your thoughts. We have some wonderful questions in the chat from both Natalie and Betsy, and I think these are, are somewhat connected. Betsy raises the question. I think both Norm, you and Mickey talked about this. We're talking about civility and we're talking about the challenges with incivility, but also the dysfunction that we're seeing at the national and the federal level. And so I'd like to hear, Julia, what you think, and, and Norm and Mickey, please jump in as well. What do we think about local and state governments in terms of what accounts for how they're engaging? But then Natalie also raises the question around kind of cultivating this new era of 
political candidates. This, these, this next group that's running and engaging, uh, should they run campaigns focused on communicating with civility being a core part of what they're doing? And that way there's this framing and norm setting around civility so that someone who's kind of going in contrast to that really in the public eye is not really, uh, you know, deemed in a positive way. So talk to us about this dysfunction that we see both on the national and federal level, but what's happening on the local and state level, and how can we engage our new political uh, group that, that, that are really being engaged in these issues, and how can we groom them for understanding the importance of the centrality of, of civility and, and what we're trying to do, and how it's really everyone's, every single American's uh, concern and issue that we have to be, be mindful of. So Julia, please jump in. So uh, here's some good news. Uh, the great journalist, James Fallows, and his wife, Deb, um, Jim is a pilot. And a couple of years ago, they went around the country stopping at small uh, communities and found many instances where people across every line were working together to solve community problems and to bring people together. That's the good news. When I look at state legislatures and an awful lot of city councils, uh, I see that the incivility is metastasized down there as well. We're finding uh, people silenced on the floor. We're finding as some of these issues, including, for example, a lot of the efforts to uh, get at the uh, LGBTQ community um, where members uh, who object to legislation that's going forward are not treated particularly well uh, and where their uh, views are expressed in fiery ways. Uh, I'm not sure that I see a positive trend moving up except in local communities where the issues may be uh, a, a different ones that are harder to put into a tribal uh, uh, frame. Thank you for that, Norm. Julia, I think we're back and we can hear you and see you. Please jump in. We want to hear your yeah, thoughts. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think I connect these issues to, and I, I should point out, I live in Milwaukee, which is one of the most segregated cities in, in the country and is a you know, majority minority and blue city in a very purple state. Um, and so state and local government does not look especially civil to me. Um, I would like to point out, though, this was the bit that I, I didn't quite get to in, in my remarks, which is that I think that any kind of conversation about how to make things more sort of deeply civic and citizen oriented is also going to have to understand the other side of the civility conversation and the ways in which people have have pushed back against civility as a concept that that sort of um, tone polices marginalized voices. And I think that's really relevant to the, the tone of political debate where I am is, you know, what is an uncivil action by a group like Black Lives Matter? What is an uncivil you know, action or discourse by groups that are advocating for, for immigrants' rights or for economic equality? I think that's all part of a larger conversation. And so I think we can lament and lament and lament that, okay, politics isn't very civil anymore, but and the reason, I think, again, goes back to this deeper question about the changing political context and the, the fact that who belongs and what kinds of claims to justice and resources belong in the political conversation are really deeply contested. And I think that what, what we've seen is that that maybe started in the national level and is, as, as Norm said, sort of is trickling into state and local politics as politics, as national politics permeates everything. But I think it's all kind of part of the same set of, of questions. Yeah, Thank you. Can I jump in here too? Please, um, yes. I, so I think uh, you used, Karen, the, the word dysfunctional. Uh, and I disagree with that word. I, I think the problem is that our system is functioning exactly the way it's designed to function. Uh, and it shouldn't be designed that way. For example, in almost every state, almost every state, when we elect members of Congress or governors or whatever, uh, we don't know who the majority wants because they, we don't have runoffs. Uh, and so you, you can, uh, you, you get 35% of the vote in your party primary in, in a, in a uh, race that is, uh, you know, a heavily Democratic district or heavily Republican district, and you, and you win that uh, with, a, with a plurality of some size, uh, and you go on to be elected. So we don't know what the majority really wanted. Uh, the, um, 
uh, the system uh, includes running for office in party primaries, and we have sore loser laws in almost every state. And therefore, uh, if you don't win your party primary, which is you know dominated by the people who are the most zealous, the most partisan, uh, if you don't win their endorsement, you can't be on the ballot. You 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 you're no longer one of the choices the voters can choose. So. Uh, what what's really messed up is our political system, and it's it's functioning the way we've designed it to function with with the the parties, the the uh, the primaries, the the non majority outcomes, uh, and that plays a role in this. Uh, we we don't elevate necessarily who um, if all the majority had their uh, anybody could run, and the majorities had their choice of who should be uh, elected. You know, maybe it would be different. We don't know. Thank you so much for that, Mickey. We have some wonderful questions in the chat and I'm looking at the time and I'm hopeful that our audience listening in will join us next time. And I'll say a little bit about our next session, but for right now, I wanna ask for Julia, Mickey and Norm to join me in listening to some final questions that we have. And I want you to help us to think about how to process these and, and a quick sound bite if you can. Um, I think I'm gonna be able to squeeze in Beth's question as well as Dennis, Dennis's question. And it, Kind of, uh, I'd like for you to think about it this way. Beth is raising the question about what hope do we have to bring civility back into the discourse? Where do we start? And in some ways, Dennis also raises this question uh, in the context of seeing that from his perspective, there was a sense of viciousness, a certain viciousness in politics that he saw that started after Barack Obama's election. And I want to know, uh, and this is uh, the question from, from Dennis, how, how do we think about these demographic shifts that we've seen in the country and kind of the rhetoric around Obama being othered with the racial undertones that we saw? And uh, one of the things that Dennis asks about is the, the idea of civility being out or being uh, on its way out of the political realm, even during that time, and that it hasn't come back. So what are some ways that we can think about recentering civility and, and how it's evolved in, in different ebbs and flows, whether it's from Newt Gingrich to the, you know, the post Obama era, uh, what are ways that we can bring it back and center that into our discourse and, and really have it be infused in our politics, our political system, and indeed for the strength of our democracy. So if each of you can just take about one minute, <laughs> I know that's, that's not a lot of time, but wanna try to get your thoughts before we wrap up tonight. Julia, you want to start us off and then Mickey and then Norm? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, there's evidence that civility is its own phenomenon, but there's a lot of evidence that it, it reflects these underlying, underlying power dynamics and underlying understandings of who's in the political community. So I kind of think the only way out is through. That's my sound bite. Yeah, well, mine is that the... Um... Uh, there, there is a lot of, and some, the Obama uh, point is a good one. I, I think for a lot of people, the ground they knew, the, the, the cu culture they knew, the environment they knew has been changing very rapidly about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, uh, the, the, you know, er everything uh, that they're accustomed to. Uh, and we have to find that unum. We have to find those things on which they can come together and emphasize you know, the areas of commonality uh, and get away from these the legitimate grievances on both the right and the left. And uh, to get past that, we have to find out, okay, but where do you agree that America is and should be? So uh, I would say that uh, we have to find a way to install some sense of shame in people when they violate these fundamental norms. That's now gone. I'm afraid tribalism makes that much more difficult because if you believe that the other side is the enemy trying to destroy your way of life, anything that you would do to attack or uh, call shameful something that your own people do could give traction to your opponents. Uh, moving away from that is our biggest challenge, but I also think we have to look at these younger generations and try and get them to view this world through a different lens. The educational system becomes an important part of that. To see it now being politicized in so many states uh, where books are no longer acceptable, where uh, discourse, if it makes anybody uncomfortable, is out of the question, although it's only 
one set of groups of people that are to be made uncomfortable. Making people uncomfortable is different from uh, incivility. Uh, you need to be able to discuss openly the areas of division, including the racial questions that have divided this society right from the beginning of our republic. Understand where they came from, understand what people, uh, that we have a common humanity. And if the educational system can't do that, then I'm afraid the next generations are gonna learn the wrong lessons, not the right ones. Thank you for that, Norm. And thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Julia. What a terrific panel. And I want to thank all of our listeners, our audience for joining us for session two, the role of civility in politics, political institutions and democracy. Tonight's panel and discussion was absolutely phenomenal. And we're so delighted that each of you joined us. I hope that you come back for session three on social justice and civil disobedience. It will take place on April 20th. So please go to the center's website so that you can get more information. And we did have a couple of questions in the chat around uh, Mickey's wonderfully written piece. We are putting together an edited volume of essays. So you'll be able to read Mickey's piece as well as the others in terms of the work that they've been doing and their research. And we're gonna share that with the larger audience. So please stay tuned for that as well. Thank you all again for joining us this evening and have a good night. Thank you.